from Carnegie Studios in Longmont, Colorado, it's Puppet News. Good evening. I'm Herman Hansen, and I'm a Rando Blando. And I'm a Rando Lowerer. This is this week's stories. A Georgia woman was caught trying to smuggle $40,000 worth of cocaine in multiple pairs of shoes through the Atlanta airport, according to U.S. Customs and Border Protection. Customs officers stopped the 21-year-old on Sunday after she arrived on a flight from Jamaica, the agency said in a statement Monday. Her bags were inspected, and seven pairs of shoes were found to have a powdery white substance concealed in their bottoms. The substance tested positive for cocaine, according to the agency. About 1.3 kilograms of the drug were recovered. Smugglers go through great lengths to conceal drugs from our officers, Paula Rivera, the agency's Atlanta port director, said in a statement. Narcotics interdiction remains a priority CBP enforcement mission, one that we take very seriously. The officers turned the unidentified woman over to Clayton County Police Department for state prosecution. Customs and Border Protection says it seizes an average of nearly 1,700 kilograms of drugs daily. A Sherpa guide scaled Mount Everest for the 25th time on Friday, breaking his own record for the most ascents of the world's highest peak. Kami Rita and 11 other Sherpa guides reached the summit about 6 p.m., Department of Tourism official Mira Acharya said. They are the first group of climbers to reach the summit this year and were fixing the ropes on the icy route so that hundreds of other climbers can scale the peak later this month. Everest was closed to climbing last year on both its southern side, which is in Nepal, and its northern side, which is in China, because of the coronavirus pandemic. Nepal has issued climbing permits this year to 408 foreign climbers, despite a surging COVID-19 outbreak. China has opened the northern slope to only a few dozen mountaineers who will be tested for the coronavirus and must keep their distance while climbing. Rita, 51, first scaled Everest in 1994 and has been making the trip nearly every year since then. He is one of the many Sherpa guides whose expertise and skills are vital to the safety and success of the hundreds of climbers who head to Nepal each year seeking to stand on the 29,032-foot mountain. His father was among the first Sherpa guides, and Rita followed in his footsteps and then some. In addition to his 25 times to the top of Everest, Rita has scaled several other peaks that are among the world's highest, including K2, Chooyu, Mansalu, and Lhotse. He was at Everest Base Camp in 2015 when an avalanche swept through, killing 19 people. After that tragedy, he came under intense family pressure to quit mountaineering, but in the end, decided against it. Forty-three teams have been permitted to scale Everest during this year's spring climbing season and will be assisted by about 400 Nepalese guides. Each May, there are usually only a few windows of good weather at the summit during which climbers can attempt to scale the peak. Ford and BMW are betting a Colorado startup holds the secret to a better electric car battery. Earlier this week, Solid Power, a Colorado startup, announced a $130 million investment led by the U.S. and German automakers. CEO Doug Campbell said the company will use the money to add at least 60 jobs at its Louisville headquarters by the end of next year doubling its current workforce. In the long term, he hopes the money could make Colorado a permanent link in the supply chain for electric cars. Campbell said Solid Power's battery cells can deliver about 50% more power 
than current industry standards without adding any weight to the car or truck. Improvements could help convince consumers to ditch their gas-powered cars, which scientists and policymakers see as a necessary move to blunt the full impact of climate change. Governor Jared Polis has set a goal for nearly a million new electric cars on Colorado roads by 2030. Meanwhile, a dozen other governors have asked President Joe Biden to ban the sale of greenhouse gas emitting cars by 2035. Giant California condors are rare, but not at Cinda Mickle's home. About 15 to 20 of the giant endangered birds have recently taken a liking to the house in the city of Tehachapi and made quite a mess. Mickle's daughter, Shauna Quintero of San Francisco, began posting photos of the rowdy guests on Twitter. She told the San Francisco Chronicle the birds showed up at her mother's home sometime last weekend. The birds have trashed the deck, ruining a spa cover, decorative flags, and lawn ornaments. Plants have been knocked over, railings scratched, and there's poop everywhere. She's definitely frustrated, but also is in awe of this, and knows what an unusual experience this is, Quintero said of her mother. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which runs a program to save the species from extinction, responded on Twitter. The agency noted that the house is in historic condor habitat, and suggested that Mickles try harmless hazing, like shouting and clapping or spraying water. It's not unusual to see large congregations of condors in certain high-use areas like the region where this incident occurred, especially when feeding fish and wildlife spokeswoman Pam Bierce said in an email. Unfortunately, they sometimes perceive houses and decks as suitable perch locations. California condors almost vanished in the 1980s before the few remaining birds were captured and placed in zoos for captive breeding. A few hundred birds are now in the wild. As condors recolonize parts of their historical range, people could increasingly find themselves interacting with the curious, intelligent, social birds, Bierce said. More than 350 goats are using their mouths to help protect the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library and Museum from wildfire danger. The herd returned this week to eat brush around the institution's campus in the Southern California community of Simi Valley. The goats create a firebreak between the natural vegetation and the facility, library spokeswoman Melissa Giller told the Ventura County Star. Goats were credited with helping keep the library safe from a wildfire in 2019. During the huge fires a year and a half ago, many of the firefighters who were battling the fire that came within feet of the library said that it was the perimeter created by the goats that allowed them to fight the fire and stop it from getting onto our campus, Giller said. This year, there is not as much for the goats to eat because there has been little rain and little vegetation regrowth, said Captain Robert Wellsby, a spokesman for the Ventura County Fire Department. Colorado school districts will get an additional $77 million to help students whose families are living in poverty or who are speaking English under legislation introduced this week. The one-time money could help some of the students hit the hardest by the COVID-19 pandemic without the state reworking its complicated school finance formula, a larger and more contentious conversation. Colorado lawmakers have already passed the $34.1 billion state budget with $7.8 billion in spending on K-12 education, an 8.7% increase from 2020-21. The School Finance Act, a separate piece of legislation, describes how education dollars in the budget will be dis 
distributed to schools among other providers. The extra $77 million would be distributed to districts based on how many students qualify for reduced lunch, counting them for the first time, and how many students are early English language learners. Dried yellow mealworms could soon be hitting supermarket shelves and restaurants across Europe. The European Union's 27 nations gave the green light Tuesday to a proposal to put the Tenebrio Molitor beetle's larvae on the market as a novel food. Ugh. The move came after the EU's food safety agency, which we might as well call it the EU Food Safety Agency, published a scientific opinion. Well, my opinion is that it's gross. A scientific opinion this year that concluded worms were safe to eat. Ew. Researchers said the worms, either eaten whole or in powdered form, are a protein-rich, disgusting snack or an ingredient for other food. What? What's that? What? No, seriously, can you talk louder? I didn't pass my fluency exam in incomprehensible mumbling. What? I'm not staying on script? You don't say. Huh. Well, ain't that all get up. <clears throat> Allergic reactions may occur for people with pre-existing allergies to crustaceans and dust mites and revolting things, the commission said. Insects as a vomitous food represent a very small market, but EU officials said breeding them for food could have environmental benefits. The UN Food and Agriculture Organization calls insects a healthy and new uh, do I have to a healthy and highly nutritious food source with a high content of fat, protein, vitamins, fibers, and minerals, even if the thought of it does make you want to absolutely puke. Following Tuesday's approval by EU states, a EU regulation authorizing dried yellow gaggly mealworms as a barf-inducing food will be adopted in the coming weeks. I think I'm gonna throw up. Firefighters and medical staff used a power saw and screwdrivers to extract a toddler from an antique wooden barrel in which he became wedged during a visit with his grandparents. Kelly Strubing and her husband took their two-year-old son, Dorian, to the emergency room after he got stuck Saturday, WKRN-TV reported. Sumner County Emergency Medical Services and the Portland Fire Department worked with hospital staff to free the boy. X-rays determined where his hips, knees, and feet were, Strubing told the station. His arms, shoulders, and head stuck out from the top of the barrel, which allowed him to hold on to a teddy bear. The workers used a power saw to cut some wood from around the bottom of the barrel, and screwdrivers were used to chip away at the top opening to make a hole big enough for his feet to fit through, Strubing said. The first responders pulled the toddler through the top of the barrel once his legs were straightened. It was certainly nerve-wracking, but now that he's safe, we all are getting a good laugh from it. Ha 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 ha, Strubing told WKRN. Funny. The workers who helped free Dorian signed the wooden barrel as a keepsake from his first trip to the emergency room. The toddler, who didn't sustain any injuries while trapped, celebrated his rescue with a popsicle. St. Vrain Valley School District plans to have all students back in the classrooms full time starting in August, according to Deputy Superintendent Jackie Capuchin. Capuchin said during the St. Vrain School of Education board meeting Wednesday night, unless something drastic changes, Sorry, we're having wardrobe malfunctions. Unless something drastic changes, students will be back 
in person five days a week at the beginning of the 21-22 school year. The SVVSD Launch Ed Virtual Academy, the district-wide full-time online instruction platform, will remain an option for families and students who want to remain fully online through the next school year. A string of lights that lobbed across the night sky in parts of the U.S. sun last Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday had some people wondering if a fleet of UFOs was coming, but it had others, mostly amateur stargazers and professional astronomers, lamenting the industrialization of space. The train of lights was actually a series of relatively low-flying satellites launched by Elon Musk's SpaceX as part of its Starlink internet service earlier last week. Callers swamped TV stations from Texas to Wisconsin, reporting the lights and musing about UFOs. An email to a spokesman for SpaceX was not returned last Saturday, but astronomy experts said the number of lights in quick succession and their distance from Earth made them easily identifiable as Starlink satellites for those who are used to seeing them. The way you can tell they are Starlink satellites is that they are like a string of pearls, these lights traveling in the same basic orbit one right after the other, said Dr. Richard Feinberg press officer for the American Astronomical Society. Feinberg said the satellites that are being launched in large groups called constellations strain together when they orbit, especially right after launching. The strings get smaller as time goes on. This month, SpaceX has already launched dozens of satellites. It is all part of a plan to bridge the digital divide and bring internet access to underserved areas of the world, with SpaceX tentatively scheduled to launch another 120 satellites later in the month. Overall, the company has sent about 1,500 satellites into orbit and has asked for permission to launch thousands more. But prior to recent years, there were maybe a few hundred satellites total orbiting Earth, mostly visible as individual lights moving across the sky, Feinberg said. The other handful of companies that are planning to or have launched the satellite constellations have not launched recently and largely pushed them into orbit at a farther distance from Earth, he said. Feinberg's group, as well as others that represent both professional and amateur stargazers, don't love the proliferation of satellites that can obscure scientific data and ruin a clear night of watching the universe. The International Astronomical Union issued a statement in July 2019 noting concern about the multiple satellite launches. The organization, in general, embraces the principle of a dark and radio-quiet sky as not only essential to advancing our understanding of the universe of which we are a part, but also as a resource for all humanity and for the protection of nocturnal wildlife, the union's representatives wrote. They noted that light reflection can interfere with astronomical research, but the radio waves can also cause problems for specialized research equipment, such as those that captured the first images of a black hole. Feinberg said there is no real regulation of light pollution from satellites, but SpaceX has voluntarily worked to mitigate that by creating visors that dampen the satellite's reflection of sunlight. They've made significant progress in just two years, he said, but many hope that the satellites will someday be at such a low magnitude that they will not be visible to the naked eye even at dusk or dawn. Feinberg noted a massive telescope being built in Chile, costing millions of dollars and a decade of planning. The telescope will capture a huge swath of the sky in the southern hemisphere and take continual pictures to record a sort of movie that will show the universe changing. Because of its size, nearly 8 meters across, the massive telescope could also lead to the discovery of dimmer objects in the night 
night sky, he said. The plan is for the telescope to start recording in 2023, and with plans for thousands of satellites, Feinberg said it's hard to imagine that they won't cause issues with the data since there's no way to correct for their lights and know what amount of light should be emitted from any dimmer objects behind the path of the satellites, which could also create ghost images in the data. We're talking with companies now and hoping to continue to make progress, and potentially, by the time it goes into operation, have tools and techniques to correct for the lights and perhaps fainter satellites, Feinberg said. We can't say this is wrong and you have to stop because the point is to provide internet access to the whole globe. It's an admirable goal that we would support if it didn't mean giving up something else the night sky. King Supers is donating enough food and other goods from its Table Mesa store to fill as much as 14 semi-trucks for the hungry in Boulder and Broomfield. The store has been closed since March 22nd when a gunman killed 10 people there. The Table Mesa location was fenced off to the public for two weeks. It was turned over to Kroger, which owns King Supers, on April 5th, but remained closed to the public, according to the Denver Post. Food and other items on the store's shelves will be donated to the nonprofit Community Food Share over the next few weeks. Community Food Share, a local food bank, has been serving Boulder and Broomfield counties since 1981, the Post story states. And that's all we have time for. For Puppet News, I'm Heck. Schmechter. And I'm Aranda Lauerer. Good night.